It's that time of the year again. It's the end of the year, and it's time to talk about our favorite stories, videos, and audio for 2015 on realagriculture.com. And I've got the whole Real Ag content team with us here today. How's everybody doing? Awesome. Okay, so let's hit the stories. Uh, Kelvin, let's start with you. What kind of stood out for you this year as you look at our top 25 of 2015? Well, obviously, equipment stories resonate with uh, with real leg readers. Uh, our number one story was about this unique combine uh, that could be made in the states starting in uh, in 2016. Uh, there was also the honeybee tractor video filmed at uh, at the Farm Progress Show in Regina. Uh, just some of the equipment stories they they just seem to to go a long way with uh, with people visiting the site. And is that why why is that uh, from your from your point of view, <laughs> I think there's some nostalgia with some of this stuff, like the the honeybee tractor. People feel a connection, or they've seen it somewhere. They maybe saw it at the, the its original appearance at the Farm Progress Show decades ago. Uh, people, yeah, just machinery catches people's eye. I don't know. There's uh, and and innovation and, and new ideas. That's like that's the kind of stuff that we like to uh, that we like to cover and, and highlight. And uh, I think there's just some exciting stuff happening with equipment and companies always looking to come up with something new well there is so much passion as it applies to those brands we were talking yesterday you know we posted a story this week about uh, versatile going with an old school paint scheme and it's like this it's like supporters for a football or a hockey team uh mm-hmm. just coming out and you know sharing and liking and it, it's just and of course then there's the haters uh you know for the people that love other brands Deb, do you find that uh, no matter where you go, machinery is still it will always be one of the, the the top attractions? Yeah, for sure. And as much as people say it's not about color, sometimes like in this last week, as we saw, it does sure seem to be a, a big factor yeah. in uh, in the overall appeal of a machine. But yeah, we also and we go, uh, high, I was gonna say we go high and low for uh, for uh, tractor stories to equipment stories. I mean. On here, there's a couple of stories on this list that I, I filed from the Farm, Farm Progress show in, in the U.S. Um, from September. And everybody's always excited to see the new equipment and uh, get a peek at it. Bern, what are some of your uh, your highlights for 15? Um, well, I look at this list. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, from an Ontario perspective, there's it's littered with uh, neonicotinoids. Uh, and uh, stories and perspectives that uh, a lot of them written by Lindsay, our good friend Lindsay Smith. Um, I think that really got a hold of people in Ontario. Um, uh, it's interesting, um, some of the things I filed here, I mean, there's a story on, you know, are we headed for another farm financial crisis? And uh, obviously the answer is no. And that was uh, that was an interview with uh, um, um, the, the gentleman from the University of Guelph, um, Alphonse Wersink. And, uh, you know, it was just a little story, but it just took off. Because, you know, again, people always have those memories of the 80s and, High interest rates and whether they'll come again. Um, I think that always gets people's attention. Um, the other thing, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was watching the news on uh, Wednesday night, and Peter Mansbridge is on the national, talking about you know food costs and how Canadians are going to have to spend so much more money in, on food. So I just dashed off a column the next morning. It just sort of grabbed me and got a bee in my bonnet, and boom, there it is, a number 18 or 19 on the top list, and it's not even out two weeks. So I think farmers really want to know that uh, you know connect with that that hey, people need to understand that you know Canadians really do get a sweet deal when it comes to food you know we produce a lot of high quality abundant food for Canadians and people don't appreciate it no no Deb what I, I'm interested to know what sticks out in your mind as far as some of the top things from 15 Okay. Uh, Well, three big stories, I guess, for me. And the first one was just because I really enjoyed doing it. At the beginning of the year, we were at Farm Tech, and we did a couple of videos kind of behind the scenes. So those really stand out for me in terms of a quality and a real uh, team contribution sort of thing. And then as we move into the year, we, of course, had the BSC Cal, which uh, some people kind of got a little irate at us for even reporting on because it was supposed to be a big secret apparently but I hope those people are realizing it wasn't a big deal and uh, as we're moving forward we're still talking about BSE trying to get those test numbers up and then third of course was uh, the NDP in Alberta which has been (laughs) 
huge in the last couple of months with uh, Bill Six coming in. So those are the three the three big stories to me that kind of stand out. And the post that we worked on together, the shoot, shovel, and shut up piece, uh, that actually made the list where we basically we basically said to people, you know, bury the shoot, shovel, and shut up attitude if you want to be in our industry going forward. For sure. And even last week, I, I revisited it, or maybe it was a couple of weeks ago now, um, with Ian Gablehouse, and he's kind of a BSE representative with the Alberta government. And he, I asked him, how do you, how does it make you feel when people say shoot, shovel, and shut up? And really wanted to talk feelings but he he was very blunt in saying listen that's not what we have to do here we actually have to be testing these animals if we want to keep up with our trade partners so mm-hmm. yeah and and you were on location for some of the bia or for some of the bill six coverage uh mm-hmm. do, you, do you find how, how, will you look back on that fondly that experience um i think it was a good experience for me it's uh I think I somehow managed to maintain kind of middle ground. I saw the ridiculousness of both sides of the story and also some of the um, good points behind, you know, farmers and behind the government. So I don't know. I, I enjoyed my, my time there and uh, for sure it was, it won't be, I won't be forgetting that anytime soon. So. Well, one of the things that really jumped out in 15 is that, uh, there's a huge response for uh, political type commentary, and we had a nat- we had a federal election, and we've uh, we of course had a provincial election in uh, in Alberta. Uh, the the national the the federal election really gained a lot of uh, interest from the farming community. A lot of it having to do with the fact that you know, why is an ag being talked about, and then it became how does the liberal majority now impact your farm, Kelvin? Uh, did it surprise you of how much political commentary resonated with the audience? Well, I think we, uh, we'd had a conservative government for almost a decade, and so I think as the election campaign rolled on and it became uh, more likely that we were going to have a liberal government, people started to think, hang on, what is this? Will we actually see any changes in terms of ag policy if, uh, if we have a liberal government, if this becomes, becomes real or reality? And uh, that is what happened. And then one of those top stories on this list where we asked Real Ag readers how, uh, how a liberal majority will, uh, will impact their farms, it was surprising. The poll, that it, we posted it the day after the election, and it started off with a very negative response. The vast majority saying a liberal majority will not be good for, uh, for my farm. And then, but as the days passed, I think there was some more thought and people actually dug into some of the liberal policies and uh, as it stands right now I believe it's about 50 50 where uh, where half the people say it will affect their farm negatively and then the other half are saying they don't know or it might even be positive so it's it's moderated but I think it took some time for people to uh, to probably become familiar with some of the positions and realize that at least in the short term it's looking like things will continue largely as they were before the election in terms of egg policy. Burn, you've been at this for a while. Does it surprise you that the mood or the, I guess the acceptance of the liberal majority has improved uh, as time has gone on? Um, I think it's wait and see. I mean, um, you know, I think that you're still in the halo effect um, and it will continue for a while until, probably until we see uh, some budget uh, sort of expectations in the spring, and uh, some people are going to be challenged to pay for a lot of the promises that are out there. And uh, you know, and that has policy impacts too. I mean, climate change, fossil fuels, and you know, the the root, sort of the foundation of the Canadian economy. So, uh, you know, it's still you're still in a honeymoon halo effect, and uh, let's see what the spring brings. No. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Along, along those lines, along those lines, Sean. Yeah, I, I agree. It's gonna right now in the short term. It's looking like egg policies. Like in the last two months, we haven't really noticed any dramatic change. But in the long term, over over four years, they could definitely make an impact. But kind of changing or along this line, um, when I look back over 2015, as a, as an egg reporter, there were three big stories that kind of came to a conclusion. Or, uh, or we saw some finality to. One was uh, one was the federal election and change in federal government. We'd had Jerry Ritz as our ag minister for 
uh, basically eight years. And so that obviously came to an end this fall. And then uh, earlier in the year, the Canadian Wheat Board, we've been talking with that for as long as I can remember, or as long as I've been reporting. And so that uh, that came to an end with the, the sale to G3. And also uh, the, uh, the third issue here, I was just uh, looking at my notes. Uh, sorry, we have to cut this out. Cool. Uh, oh, you think we will? <laughs> <laughs> there was one other thing I had. What was it? No. Oh, cool. cool. Just a few weeks ago. Uh, the third thing on the list, country of origin labeling, just a couple days ago, the U.S. repealing it. And we've been talking about that for also, that's also been a, over, well, 13 years since the first, Canadian livestock groups went down to the states to talk about it, and so lots of uh, lots of big changes and issues that uh, that we've been covering for many years came to an end uh, in in 2015. Well, and some of those big topics, uh, as we put some to rest, uh, some will forever continue to be topics. It seems like you know, for example, during the TP, we had a lot of discussion about TPP, mm-hmm. uh, that trade deal, and. Uh, as it applied during the election to what is the future of supply management. And, and so, you know, that will continue to thrust on as it seems as a topic as well. Yeah. Yeah. And here in Ontario, I mean, it's going back to the lip of majority here. I mean, like, you know, we've, the, uh, the B issue, the neonicotinoid issue uh, was gone on and it's sort of like it's settled into our, a sense of reality, but here in Ontario, we're all wondering what's next, right? Um, what, what's the next issue? Um, we're going to, I think we're going to see about phosphorus and how uh, Ontario farmers manage nutrients. I think that's going to be the issue of, uh, of 2016. I guess, you know, uh, we've got a, a government that, uh, in Ontario now that's pretty much an urban government. And that urban-rural divide, I think, is, is becoming more and more pronounced. So it, it'll, it'll be a fascinating year in Ontario, I think. Well, it's going to be interesting, as Deb and I watch from Alberta here, it's to see uh, the battle of Ontario versus Alberta and to see which government can prove they're more left. <laughs> Hang on, Manitoba's in the next two. <laughs> <laughs> Never to be forgotten. And then everybody just sort of looks at it. You know, I had three people text me in the last three days. Why can't there be more Brad Walls? It's just, it's funny how his celebrity and his brand, with all of this leftism going on around him uh his brand continues to increase he's like nike or apple like he's just uh, it's, it's amazing <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you know, when, when, my, uh, when my good friends in newfoundland elected a liberal government uh, last month uh, it was the last it was the end i mean there are no conservative governments in power in canada right that was the last one with, with uh, the uh, conservative in the name yeah. 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 yes yeah. yeah deb what were you going to say Oh, um, oh, when when there was all the Redford nonsense going on in Alberta and uh, Lindsay was still with us, we had thought maybe we could have Al Saskatoba and it would all be under Brad Wall. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, the movement that will never die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things that I think uh, makes, and I, I am sort of biased here, but one of the things that does make real agriculture different is our our willingness and sometimes our uh, I guess maybe us being a little bit brave to challenge uh, forms of thought, right? And uh, I think you know for for me one of the most important articles of the year was when as a group we wrote a well we put together this article on uh, farm safety and it, you know maybe needing to question some of our farm safety traditions and. Um, it was prior to Bill 6. Uh, Bill 6 is clearly, as everyone's sort of finding out, is not really about safety. Uh, but uh, it was really, really uh, an interesting time in October to really kind of start that conversation around farm safety. Would you agree, Deb? Oh, yes, for sure. Yeah. And I think uh, a lot of people, I mean, the conversations are still going, even though, as you say, many people disagree that Bill 6 is no longer or maybe never was about farm safety, the the conversations at dinner tables are still going on about farm safety. And it's amazing how many people um, that once said, you know what, like just stay out of our lives are saying, yeah, maybe we do need some accountability there. Now, the three of you spent a lot of time 
putting together this table, comparing uh, Bill 6 components or characteristics to all the other provinces. And what blew me away is how we as an industry completely lack understanding of some of these rules and regulations inside our own province and what's going on in other provinces. It was hard to put that table together. You guys spent a lot of time doing that. Yeah, there was some time spent putting that table together, but I think it brought some clarity, or that was our attempt at least, to bring some, some clarity to the discussion because a lot of, as, as you mentioned before, a lot of the complaints and concerns aren't completely founded on uh, on something that we know for certain. And so to have some comparison and, and kind of start with, okay, this is what we what we know and this is what, what they have actually committed to, that kind of comparison, I think, we at least hope uh, hope helped uh, clear the clear the air a little bit. Um, when I was in, we we went to ranching for profit this year, and one of the key principles is is to use six hats, and it starts with the white hat, I think, <laughs> which is um, just talking about facts. And I think that's what that table did. Is it it just said like, okay, we can't compare provinces if we don't know what's going on. Here are the facts, and I think a lot of people. Uh, respected that and and started to think a little bit differently about legislation across the country. And I think a uh, big kudos to Kelvin for putting that together. I did the Ontario stuff, and uh, it was a lot of work just trying to sort of piece that, looking through uh, regulations and finding people just to put together one province. And I know uh, it uh, if you if you look at it in a whole, it's very valuable. And uh, kudos to Kelvin for putting that together. Do you guys continue to find that one of the interesting things about, or the fun things about the site is the ability, we, covering the whole country, um, you know, being the only ag media company under one brand uh, covering ag, and, you know, I continue to hear, you know, as we see, we, you know, in 2015, uh, Wheat Pete uh, joined the team as the national agronomist, and, you know, we've got... Uh, He's, he's got his weekly podcast, which is very Ontario-centric at this point. But you know, we've got people from the West calling in, asking him questions. Uh, it, it really does, that the sort of having an idea of what's going on across the country really is, it continues to keep me interested every day. Totally. And I think we often in agriculture have, and I think there's a growing realization of this, that we can't just focus on our specific commodity or our specific region there has to be some more big picture and, and overall industry-wide kind of approaches. So, yeah, to, to see everything as it's happening across the country and how it relates, because often uh, here in southern Manitoba, we often have more in common with Ontario than, say, Saskatchewan or Alberta. And so there's all kinds of things that we can learn that I think in the past maybe haven't been haven't been covered or, or fairly portrayed because, because we're so focused on our geography or our specific... Uh, and I don't, I don't think it's, and it's just not across the country too. I mean, like right, Sean, you've been everywhere, but I've been to Wisconsin, Kentucky, um, Iowa, Illinois, um, and reported from all these places this year. And you know, people want to know. I mean, the industry sort of just you know, whether you want to call it globalization or what, but I um, mean, you know, what's happening in agriculture all over you know the world, North America, has an impact at home, and there's something for every farmer or everywhere we go. Well, I'll tell you what, one of the highlights for me for sure was the opportunity that Dagger Sciences Canada provided, which is uh, providing the opportunity for us to go to Germany to Agritechnica. Uh, it was Jay and I and my dad had a great time um, slugging it out for four days across the across Hanover and, you know, every day averaging, I think something, I think it was like 15,000 steps a day. We did 45 videos in four days. It was... Uh, it was an awesome experience, and uh, I look forward to hopefully being able to go in two years again. Well, you had to burn off the rat killer, right? <laughs> yes, the beer that we had nicknamed the rat killer, we did. It was, uh, you can't go to a German uh, farm show or probably any European farm show without, uh, it's funny, you know, the differences between across all the regions, right? There are characteristics of farm shows in Alberta that are different than Saskatchewan, they're different than Manitoba, they're different in Ontario. And then as you go south to the U.S., you also see a lot of differences. And then when you go to Europe, there's a lot of things that's like, man, we do not do that in Western Canada or Ontario. So it's really interesting to see the differences in some of the shows and conferences as you do travel across the globe to bring this content back to the audience. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, <laughs> like like burn, for example, those deep fried turkey legs that they have in uh, in the U.S. You, we don't have those in Canada. What's the deal? No, and there's I know because you didn't go to Wisconsin this year. There's a lot more cheese in in that state. Uh, we're cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, in 2004, the Dairy Expo, the yeah. World Dairy Expo, missed you. <laughs> yeah, my gut didn't miss all the cheese that I consumed in 2014 at that show. It was yep. uh, you. You put a plate of artisan cheese in front of me with crackers, and it's uh, game over. <laughs> <laughs> so as we look uh, look back on 15, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't actually chat very quickly about uh, 2016. What do you what do you what are you guys individually all looking forward to? <laughs> hmm, dropped that one on you, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> I would say, well, here we have uh, a provincial election coming up in uh, in April. So, speaking of Manitoba being an NDP government, right now it's looking like we could be switching to, uh, uh, according to the polls, the PCs have a, a strong lead. So, we'll see how that unfolds here in the next couple of months. But, of course, farm shows over January, February, and March. Looking forward to getting out and talking to people and meeting people that we talk to on Twitter, face-to-face, and all that kind of stuff. It, it would be something if Manitoba had a conservative provincial government and Alberta was NDP. Wouldn't that be a reversal and of that, fortune? And that's totally a possibility in April. Hmm. In politics, you never know. Uh, Deb, what do you think? Uh, I'm I'm interested to keep following the Trans-Pacific Partnership and see what the new government thinks of that. I mean, it's a mess. And uh, I can't even begin to imagine reading it, but I will be following those who do read it. And, yeah, and just seeing where the conversation about dairy goes, because I think we just hit it and then people get annoyed and then we pretend like we're not talking about it anymore. So uh, definitely uh, trade deals like like the TPP. Well, I've said it before and I'll say it again that, uh, and it came up again this week when Kelvin did the interview and posted it with uh, sort of a, a wrap up with Jerry Ritz and looking back at his time as ag minister, I, I still maintain that Jerry Ritz was a better friend to the dairy industry in Canada than they will they will ever admit. And so I agree, it's going to be very interesting to watch it going forward. Uh, Byrne, what do you say? Um, it'll be interesting in Ontario. Um, you know, I think phosphorus and the environment. It'll be interesting where Kathleen Wynne and Jeff Leal uh, and our environment minister. Uh, take the agenda in the next year. Uh, it was a, uh, as I say, it was a challenging year, uh, 2015. Um, as I, say, I thought, phosphorus and the environment are really going to have the light uh, shine on it this year. It'll be uh, fun going out to a lot of the the conferences this winter. Um, Southwest Ag conferences coming up right after Christmas, and we've got all kinds of uh, outstanding, incredible experts coming to town. Uh, going to share some stuff. Uh, we just had a, a record corn crop here, 170 bushels per acre. And, uh, you know, Ontario really has almost like the yield punch of Iowa and Illinois now. And uh, so it would be great to talk about that. Um, interesting going in February down to the um, uh, internet, the uh, the Fire Machinery Show in Louisville. Um, that's really cool because every year everybody rolls out their it's just sort of kind of like their second rollout of equipment, and uh, there's lots of great unveilings. And um, maybe the Commodity Classic in New Orleans is uh, on the list a little later in March, and uh, that uh, that could be fun and maybe some trouble. Yeah, you know, every year you kind of look forward and you sort of you think you kind of have it figured out as far as what the top story is going to be or what are going to be some of the issues. And I, I think I do sort of look forward to the surprise. Right? Who who knew that Bill Six was going to consume uh, our editorial content lives for for you know the basically October through the end of December here? And you know that story is obviously not done. Um, you know you look at the conference season schedule that we have, and I, I know my calendar looks uh, quite full. And uh, I am I'm, I should have just bought shares in in the Hilton. Uh, but you know you, as you as you look at it. It's that's really the interesting thing about all of this is the the exploration and uh, the uh, just how some things just surprise you, uh, whether that's a piece that you did a video that you know you just did a video at a show with somebody and you talk to them and all of a sudden it just takes off, or it's uh, it's an editorial piece that you write because you feel a bit passionate about something at a certain time and you get it down on on your computer screen and then people really respond to it so. 
I really look forward to across the country. There's so much going on uh, agriculturally, politically. Uh, we've got commodity prices going down. We've got machinery costs going up. You know, we can definitely expect a lot of uh, pieces and content about, you know, farmers trying to balance that income statement. And we'll do that with Mind Your Farm Business. We've got Tech Tour Live coming up in March uh, across Western Canada, four dates and locations. Uh, Chip Eichelberger being our... Uh, uh, keynote speaker and the inclusion of Wheat Pete, Tom Wolf, and as well Rob Hannum, a friend of the site as well. So, uh, looking forward to that. And there's there's just so much to uh, to promo and talk about. I look forward to to everything that we we bring to the audience. So, anything else, guys? Um, and lady, Stanley Cup. <laughs> the St- you're looking forward to the Stanley Cup? No, not at all. But I mean, we have the real leg <laughs> hockey pool. So. We do have the real leg hockey yeah. pool. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and we should also, looking back, we haven't even mentioned the Blue Jays run yet. That's probably one of the big highlights of 2015 as well, right? That you know what? Maybe one. it's best we kept sports out of it. Uh, oh, <laughs> no, Deb. Oh, no. Because <laughs> we're already probably running at 20 minutes and we didn't even talk about sports. Yeah, we didn't even talk about the Blue Jays. How did we go 28 minutes and not talk about the Blue Jays? <laughs> we are only two months away from pitchers and catchers reporting, uh, which is fantastic. But uh, yeah, and we did. We, that was actually kind of cool. We did the poll: or Have you caught Blue Jays fever? And, and you know, the, clearly there is a co- there's a component of the audience that uh, sports is a, is a big deal. They caught it. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, they haven't been cured because we have a you know the 2016 season is very very important. Okay, yeah, well, guys, it sounds, like oh, it sounds like they're getting real grass in the infield at least of Sky Dome. So uh, the converting to the. They're converting that it to dirt. That. To dirt, yes. Oh, okay, yeah. the whole thing? Yes. Uh, okay. Well, no, just the uh, the base paths. The base paths will be dirt, and then the inside will be turf. So technically, all the infielders can stand on dirt, just like they would in any other stadium. Oh. So no grass yet? Not yet. To follow up on Burns' conversation with the Guelph researchers working on that. Yeah, so the new Shapiro, the new president, has come out and said that uh, they may not convert the whole the whole stadium to grass now because they may use some of that budget to do other upgrades uh, yeah. in Rogers Center. Well, as we found out with our interview with uh, a gentleman from the uh, uh, the researcher from the uh, the Turf Grass Institute here in Guelph, um, it was such a big job, right? Because that building was not constructed to have living, breathing grass in it. Um, all of the moisture. You know, uh, you know all the humidity, and uh, I think that's what they're they were going to do the test this year to see what type of uh, atmosphere they were going to be sort of going into, and what type of infrastructure build um, that was going to have to take place to bring in again, you know, the drainage system and on and on and on. And I got a funny feeling that's a big price tag, and that's why you're seeing these guys back away from it. There is not a story we will not work on, eh? You guys, you guys realize that? <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I always love when uh, somebody will send me an email and be like, hey, have you seen this product? Oh, yeah, we did a video on that like two months ago. Like it's, it, <laughs> yeah. That, we're like, in, uh, that's kind of the cool part is you look back and you use the search on the site. It's like an index of products and, and, and people. It's, uh, it's pretty cool when you can do those kind of things. Oh, yeah. So cool. And plus, we do really weird things, which is awesome, too. And we even do Star Wars. Uh, I give the uh, Spray Guys uh, a shout-out for uh, their uh, their inspiration this week. Uh, yeah, and we haven't even gotten a lawsuit yet. No, no. And no, one's, uh, <laughs> no one's pulled it, taken off YouTube. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, they've gotten a lot, of, uh, a lot of eyeballs and a lot of views on their... Uh, their uh, spray mist series and uh, and the, certainly cashed in on Star Wars as well. Okay, before we wrap up here, what is your what was your favorite interview or favorite column oh. of 2015? Oh. Okay, here we go. You ready? No, I'm not going first. Though I do know mine. <laughs> okay, we'll start off locally with Deb. Deb? No, I don't. Oh, I have no idea. Oh my gosh, but there's like 12 months worth of stuff that I haven't gone through. <laughs> what is your favorite TikTok? TikTok. Okay, you know what? Okay, my favorite uh, was one that I found. <laughs> no big deal. Um, okay, my favorite was the Primo 5000 pellet harvester because I think. A, it's a machine, so people really resonate with machines. I seem to love it. And B, it's 
an awesome new innovative technology that could have big potential in North America. Um, so yeah, I, I really enjoyed finding out, out about that before Agritechnica and then even finding out that Sean had done an interview on it, which we can look forward to in 2016 uh, on the tech tour. So that's my, my big one. Cool. We did do a video. It is going to come out uh, in our tech tour content series, and it is just as impressive in person as when Deb talked about it. Uh, the world's only mobile pelletizer. Continuous flow, which is very, very cool. So, uh, good. That's awesome. And, uh, Kelvin, top story of 2015. I, you were I'm given enough sure. time. You were given enough time. Come on. <laughs> enough time. The interview I did with uh, former Ag Minister Jerry Ritz last week was a highlight. Um, he has lots of stories, and he, someday he should write a book about his... I know not everybody agrees with him or, or thinks he made the right choices or made the right uh, moves, but he he would have some extremely good insight into how how Ag works at, at that federal level. But I'm, I think I wrote, a, I wrote a piece early in the year... It's a, it's something that often bugs me, and it kind of goes along the lines with Burns piece on uh, on food costs and how we often take we actually take things for granted about how we need to go beyond the headline often. We, when mainstream media covers agriculture, it's often simplified and it's it's made to fit into this short news cycle that we have nowadays. And agriculture is often more complex and there's more to it than than just the headline and I wrote a column or an opinion type piece on it early in the year that it's something that I, I, I feel like I bring back often because we often we just need to go beyond the headline off in agriculture there's more to the story and, and that one was spurred by uh, the international the UN agency saying that glyphosate causes cancer or, or that was what the headlines were saying when really when you dug into it there was more to it and, and it's more complex than, than just the headline and, and I think Sums up a lot of a lot of what uh, the issues that that we have with agriculture is. People outside outside of it don't understand it. Very true. Continues to be something that we fight all the time. And, you know, and I I encourage everyone to uh, to listen to Kelvin's interview with Jerry Ritz. Uh, you know, who, who I've heard described two ways. Well, maybe three ways, depending on where you, uh, what side of the issue you're on. Uh, some people feel very strongly that Jerry was, uh, you know, if you were uh, very pro wheat board, obviously you didn't like Jerry's time uh, as ag minister. Uh, but the more common, the other two were uh, maybe the most impactful ag minister we have had in in the last 50 years or ever. Uh, and I had somebody actually say to me yesterday, who's uh, you know got a pretty good opinion. Um, or informed opinion, said uh, Jerry Ritz, the last great ag minister, uh, mm-hmm. which is, that's even maybe a bigger compliment. So uh, I encourage everybody to check that out. Uh, Burn, favorite story oh. of 2015. Well, you know, there's so many of them. Uh, I always sort of go and think about where stories come from and, you know, how, how they get started. And, uh, you know, I wrote one on uh, GMOs and tattoos in in the uh, in the natural food section of, of the grocery store, and it was just a, you know, I love going in that section to see, uh, you know, what the latest products are, you know, um, grass-fed cheese and all those type of things. Um, and there's one guy, and he's got he's reaching in, and he's got this massive tattoo down his arm, and he's reaching in, and he's he says, got to find this. I'm looking for non-GMO, non-GMO. That don't trust those. Uh, I, won't, I won't use the words that he said. Um, and I, and I'm, looking, I'm looking at this tattoo, and I said, man, you won't eat GMO, but you, you inject all this ink under your skin. And it got me thinking about, you know, um, you know how safe the tattoos are compared to GMOs. And, you know, it was just a great column, and it got a lot of views, a lot of eyeballs, and a lot of likes on Facebook. And, you know, people just, you know, I, people don't think, you know, um, critically think about, you know, um, I guess food safety and you know the things that they do in their lives uh, they, they just apply different rules to different things and uh, it's always interesting when you write a column about something um, like that and people start thinking oh yeah that is true um, so those are those are neat things especially when they they just happen from uh, from like in encounters in a grocery store my favorite piece is actually the whole portfolio or suite or offering of content that we did on bill six 
um, everything from starting off with uh, the discussion around uh, questioning farm safety traditions to uh, interviewing the labor minister right after the bill was announced to interviewing and I think giving the Alberta Ag Minister some very, very difficult, tough questions and making him you know, admit that he was not going to vote against the bill uh, and basically vote against farmers' wishes, uh, to being able to personally be invited on to 6.30 Ched, the morning show, and did an hour and a half in studio to talk about Bill 6. Uh, and finally, I think, um, or I guess before finally, is uh, you know the, the amount of pictures uh, and co- an on-location coverage that Deb did where she went to the Red Deer Town Hall and even though she was media, still couldn't get in the room and covered the town hall meeting from the, the front steps of uh, the building in Red Deer. And then finally, um, the opportunity, which is kind of a highlight, which was to interview somebody that traditionally we don't wouldn't really interview that has anything to do with egg, which was getting to interview Ian Brody, who used to be the former chief of staff for uh, Prime Minister Stephen Harper. So it really, just the diversity of comment and thought uh, from editorial to getting opinion through interviews to covering a story through pictures, I think we really, really did an awesome, objective job of, of covering that topic. So that, that's definitely the highlight for me. Okay, that's 2015. That's enough. That's That, we, that was 38 minutes, if you can believe it. <laughs> the audience is still there. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they are. Okay, we'll everybody, thank you very much for uh, for joining me. What the hell are you doing working? Get back to your families. Yeah, for another eggnog. Will do. Thank you. <laughs>